My dearly beloved in Christ, today's gospel is taken from the sixth chapter of St. John, and we have to admire the enthusiasm of these people who followed our Lord to the other side of the lake in order to be close to him, to hear his words, and to see his miracles. And they were so enthralled that they didn't think to take provisions with them as they traveled some distance. And after our Lord had preached, he looked at the vast multitude and he said to his apostles, give them something to eat because if we don't, they will faint on the way going back to their homes. And the apostles said, we could not possibly feed such a multitude. And they were in a desert place. There were no towns close by where they could purchase food. And one of the disciples says, well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are these among so many? Now that is interesting that the number, five loaves, two fishes, the number of items was seven. And that our Lord multiplied these loaves and fish, to feed a vast multitude. We're told 5,000 persons. And in like manner, our Lord nourishes the faithful through the sacraments. There are seven sacraments, just as there were seven objects of five loaves of bread and two fish. And we also divide the sacraments into two categories, the sacraments of the living and the sacraments of the dead. The two sacraments of the dead are baptism and penance because their primary purpose is to provide the life of grace to a soul that is dead through sin. Original sin in the case of baptism and actual sins in the case of penance. So their primary reason is to restore the life of grace. Those are the two sacraments of the dead. The other sacraments must be received in the state of grace, and they are called the sacraments of the living. Now, again, it is interesting that the number of items was seven. So our Lord nourishes us, not with bread and fish, but with the sacraments, and in particular, with the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Now, I believe that our Lord worked this miracle specifically with the Holy Eucharist in mind. And we know this because the very next day, he traveled back overnight to Capernaum, and there he was speaking in the synagogue the following day, and he was speaking about the Holy Eucharist. Let me read his words. So the the gospel for today's Mass is the first 15 verses of chapter 6. You should read sometime the rest of chapter 6 of St. John, but here's part of what our Lord said the following day. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the desert and have died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that if anyone eat of it, he will not die. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews on that account argued with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus therefore said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life everlasting, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and as I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also shall live because of me. This is the bread that has come down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and died. He who eats this bread shall live forever. Now imagine how strange these words were to the people who were there. What? 
He'll give us his flesh to eat, his blood to drink. What is this? What kind of a teaching is this? And in fact, it says in the gospel that many of his disciples, many of those who were following him, left him and followed him no longer because they said, this is a hard saying. Who can accept it? And our Lord turned to the apostles and said, will you also leave? And St. Peter said, speaking for the rest, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. In other words, Peter was saying, Lord, I don't understand what you're saying, but we believe in you and we're not going to leave you. And this occurred one year before the Last Supper. So then the apostles understood one year later what our Lord was saying, that I will give you my flesh to eat and my blood to drink. And is it not amazing that as our Lord took five loaves of bread and two fish and blessed them and distributed them and they multiplied and fed the vast multitude, so also our Lord feeds Catholics throughout the world daily and especially on Sundays with his own body and blood in Holy Communion. And this is the interesting fact about the Holy Eucharist that although there is only one Jesus Christ. Each person who comes to the communion rail and receives our Lord, receives him whole and entire. You don't receive a little part of our Lord. And someone else receives another little part and so forth. Each of us receives our Lord whole and entire in Holy Communion. So what a wonderful gift that our Lord would nourish our souls. And certainly the Holy Eucharist is the most important of the seven sacraments. It is the greatest of the seven sacraments because it contains the body and blood of our Lord himself. And he is here in our tabernacles. He is offered in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, but especially we are able to receive him in Holy Communion. Now you know that the Church has a law. One of the laws of the Church, and it is referred to as the Easter duty, And the law is that the faithful must receive Holy Communion every year during the Easter time. And it is sad that the church would have to make such a law. This law was enacted in the Fourth Lateran Council in the year 1215. And then it was reiterated in the Council of Trent several hundred years later and incorporated into church law that the faithful are obligated to go to confession, receive Holy Communion at least once a year. But we should want to receive our Lord as often as possible. As long as we are in the state of grace, we have observed the fast, we desire to receive our Lord, he wants us to come and receive him. And here, in this regard, we have to be very careful that we don't give in to scrupulosity, as some do, and think, well, I am not worthy This is what Jansenism taught. Several, three or four hundred years ago, people would only go to communion once a month at the most, maybe only once or twice a year because of this strong feeling of unworthiness. But we know we are unworthy. This is what we say right before communion. The priest holds up the host and says three times, Domine non sum dignus, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul will be healed. So we know we are not worthy. And our Lord knew that when he instituted the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, but he did so anyway. And he says, come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. So he wants us to receive him, even though we are so unworthy. Of course, one must never receive the Holy Eucharist in the state of mortal sin. That would be a terrible sacrilege. That would be like the crime of Judas. Remember what Judas did? He wanted to betray our Lord to his enemies, but he wanted to appear as a friend of our Lord. So he went up and gave him a kiss on the cheek as the identification of the one that the soldiers should arrest. And our Lord said, Judas, Do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And that is what a Christian does who approaches the altar rail, knowing he's in the state of mortal sin. 
he's coming as a friend of our Lord, but yet receives him into a heart that is in the possession of the devil, a soul in the state of mortal sin. So that would be a terrible thing. And obviously we're not talking about that when we say that we're unworthy, but we should come anyway. As long as we know we are in the state of grace, we have observed the fast, we should go to our Lord, receive him often in Holy Communion, and as devoutly as we can, make a good preparation beforehand and a devout thanksgiving afterwards. Do not be so anxious to leave the church as soon as possible after Mass is over. For those moments when you have our Lord within you, are the most precious moments of the day, of your life, where our Lord is disposed to grant what you ask. And he is there as the guest of your soul. So our Lord, through his priests, through his church, continues this miracle of multiplication. But instead of multiplying loaves to feed bodies, he multiplies his own presence to feed our souls. If a man did not eat, he would gradually become more and more faint and weak and eventually would die of starvation unless sustained by a miracle, as indeed some of the saints were. So likewise, if we fail to receive our Lord's body and blood in Holy Communion, we will spiritually faint we, our soul will wither away. We won't be able to remain in the state of grace. We need this spiritual nourishment. Let us give thanks for it. Let us receive our Lord often and as devoutly as possible. And let us be forever grateful that he nourishes not just our bodies, which he does as well, but that he nourishes our souls with his own body and blood and reflect upon that wonderful promise. He who eats this bread and drinks of this cup will have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.